you found the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black. The nation and the league arrive in Las Vegas in 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's Silver and Black Today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. All right, welcome back, everybody. Happy Sunday to everybody out there. Summer Sunday, and you are listening to Las Vegas' only all Raiders talk show, and that, of course, is The Silver and Black here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Brought to you by our sponsors, the Local 872, the men and women building the Raiders' new stadium. And, of course, that stadium had some big news this week as well with other activity. We'll talk about that a little uh, little later in the show because it's a big deal not only for the Raiders but also for the state of Nevada and for the Las Vegas Bowl. So there's a little tease, as they call it in the biz, uh, for you. Also, today's show brought to you by Moneyline Sports Bar and Book at Park MGM home of the NBA Finals and the NHL Stanley Cup Final. Come by and enjoy great food, beer specials for each playoff game. Tonight, the Blues will try to close out the Bruins on ice. And Monday night, the Raptors hope to win the first NBA title in franchise history. Come to Moneyline at Park MGM. Eat, drink, and bet. There you go. So we are back thanks to our sponsors for bringing you this show because without them we don't have it so we appreciate it very very much park mgm and of course the men and women at the local 872 joining me today as always are my co-hosts partners in crime first of all mr kelly kreiner how you doing kelly excellent mm-hmm. gentlemen how are we doing this morning doing good brother it's uh it's a good day uh we get to talk about raider football again Chaz Osborne also hey. here. Chaz, how you doing, buddy? Oh, good. I actually went to the MGM uh, the money line the other night to watch the uh, hockey game. Did you? Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Good food, good time in there. Yeah. Our our friend Tony Cardasco with Saturday Sports Beat, which runs in this time slot on Saturdays, was out there doing a remote yep. with Paul Eihander here yep. from CBS Sports Radio. So it's good time. Good stuff. All right. So today's show, we have a lot in store for you. Uh, of course, uh, the big one is Steve Delson, who's a Peabody award-winning uh, journalist and writer. He was at ESPN, won um, the Peabody for his work on the NFL concussion issue as part of Outside the Line. So if you've watched that show, you've probably seen work by Steve. Steve is going to be here to talk about one of my favorite Raider subjects, and that, of course, is the twos, John Matuzak, Two. um, who left us 30 years ago next week, believe it or not. So he passed away 30 years ago last week. So Steve was the co-author of his autobiography. So we're going to talk to Steve uh, for the second half of this hour to talk to him about John Matuzak, because it's really a fascinating story. And guys, I don't know about you, but in prep for the show, because I know we all – we're looking at uh, information and reading uh, Steve's book and other accounts of, of John Matuzak's life and career. Um, not a lot of stuff out there. Like, I mean, there's stuff on him, of course, but for as good of a player as he was now, we're going to get into this later. He could have probably been much better and had a better career had he not had a lot of the off the field issues. But I was just surprised that there just wasn't more out there. Cause usually like a guy like this, you find just a ton of information. Yep. Um, but, uh, there's there's clearly most people know him from a movie where you couldn't even tell it was him. And that, of course, hey, was you Goon. guys, hey, you guys, <laughs> ice, ice pirates, man, ice, ice pirates. pirates. So you like better ice movie. pirates. <laughs> not better than Goonies, but it's a better part. I understand. Yes. One crazy summer. One crazy that summer is great in that, too. So we're going to talk a lot about John Matuzak today. And I think you guys will enjoy that. It's it's part of Raider history. And he obviously won two Super Bowls with the team and so we want to explore that and steve delson will join us in the second hour we're going to talk about a little bit about the raider mystique about those players because the golden age if you call it or the silver age i guess we don't call it yeah. golden, of raider football in the 70s and 80s uh the bad boys and all the great stories you hear from folks like phil villapiano and others um could that even happen in today's li- i mean could you even have personalities like john matuzak like lyle alzado we're going to talk about that and ask that question uh, top of the second hour. Then we have Kelly's Corner. Kelly's going to talk a little bit about Canada, eh? Hey. Um, and then bottom of the second hour, if you're looking for, guys, a stadium update, especially on the financials, 
uh, how things are going, what's happening there. <coughs> Jeremy Aguero from the uh, from Applied Analysis, which is a group working with the stadium, and Jeremy also, if you watch any of the stadium advisory committee meetings, Jeremy's the guy who runs the meeting. He's phenomenal, uh, just a brilliant guy. He's going to be with us at 930 to talk about that. And then we'll close out the show talking about some more Raider news and information. Also, big guest announcement for next week. So you don't want to miss that one, guys. We have uh, somebody really uh, fascinating, interesting as we explore players during the summer here and, and really get in depth on some of them. This is a Raider you know. This is a Raider who is infamous and continues to be and has had just a amazing life full of trouble, but also um, hopefully in his redemption period. So we're going to talk about that and let you know who that is. So that's an update on what's going on with today's show, gentlemen. Um, this week, talking about the Raiders, and we're going to get into OTAs in the next, uh, the next next after the next break and really think about uh, what happened this week. But um, when you look at the Raiders, I'm just getting the sense overall – and, and maybe, you know, OTAs, I think, are way overrated. It's just, a, you know, for football fans and for media folks like us, it's just something to talk about. But I just get the sense that the cohesiveness going into this season, going into training camp next month, uh, at the end of next month, um, it just seems different. Maybe that's year two. Kelly, do you, are you picking up on any of that? Are you buying any of it? Or do or, or you think it's too early? It's uh, it's a little bit of the year two thing with Gruden, you know, the that initial shock and excitement's over. The guys are kind of, but it's also you've you brought in a lot of older veterans, so it's like you're in that phase where you're trying to get everybody kind of together. So it's we saw it with AB at you know Derek showing up at Derek Carr's house, mm-hmm. you know. So you're getting these guys trying to get intertwined and in everything before the season starts, and you're going to see that a lot more when you bring in a bunch of high priced kind of. It's everybody's trying to put on a good their best foot yeah. forward, so to speak. That's nice. Uh, everybody, they've all just got positive things to say about each other. And that's what OTAs are, right? We talked mm-hmm. about that last week. Just it, just a positive, you know, you don't want to hear anything negative. As long as everything's yeah. just status quo and they're getting their work done, that's the most important thing. No no bad news is coming out of it. That's yeah. The less we have to talk about, the best for the, for the team <laughs> and the season. Yeah, absolutely. But it no. sounds like they're all on the same page. They all got this positive energy going. We're moving in the right direction. Yeah, no, I, I think that – and that's important. I think you, you, you look at – there's still some outside sources or not sources, outside influences. The media in general, I think outside of the Bay Area media covering them, which I think the Bay Area media has, has done a good job of, of accurately um, capturing what's going on there. Uh, but to me, though, I think you're just starting to you, – you're right, Kelly, year two. Um, but it's just things are smoothing out, right? And, and when things smooth out like that – you just have less volatility, and um, so so we're, I think we're seeing that stability. You, you you now have a coach that again is going to be there for ten years unless something drastic happens, which I doubt. So so the commitment there, the regime, if you call it, you have Mike Mayock there. That seems to be working really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think once you get into camp, if you guys agree, I think once you get into camp and you start hitting people and you start and all that starts happening and you're spending much more time together as a full team, that's when we'll see kind of how this team right. is shaping up. Not only from on the field, but also from a locker room perspective, right? Yeah. The the OTAs, the non-contact, all that stuff like that, you know, it's easy to be all happy and friendly and everything. But you're right. Once you start getting physical, once you start, you know, you start getting into, you know, actual contact to where it's like, okay, now you're playing for position, now you're playing for spots. Right. That competition's going to kind of breed some of the bad stuff that you hear about in OTAs, like the fights that you see on ESP or whatever. <laughs> so it, now it's all now it's just time to get all together, be all happy and smiley before the real stuff starts. Yep. Yes, like REM, shiny, happy people, <laughs> right? <laughs> Who? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah. But what's interesting, too, and Chaz, you picked up on it, um, was a little bit of the the change in – vocabulary yep. we've seen there's a they are the oakland raiders for this year right kelly yep. you talked about this in, in in pre-show um but you're starting to see them talk about the raiders right. uh, hey being a raider 
not a lot. Not, the Oakland stuff starting to come back a little bit as they make this transition. Again, a, a hard transition to move from one market to the other, but it's happening. It was a weird one. Yeah, when Antonio Brown last week when he was talking, he he said he was about to say Oakland Raiders. He kind of stopped himself, and then he just said the Raiders. And I'm wondering, you know, are they just kind of pulling back and already distancing themselves from Oakland? You know, it's that's something they should embrace, obviously, for this last year. Well, and, I, you know, I don't know if it's distancing or if it's just more of, hey, we have to start thinking about the future. Yep. You know, it's not a diss. It's a just you have to start training yourself to think about, hey, we are going to be Las Vegas's team. That's going to be our home. Right. And so we need to do that. But uh, just really interesting to see that dynamic happening uh, and and what's going on? There, Las Vegas is definitely mentioned a lot more now. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you when you hear conversations, especially Gruden, Gruden's actually mentioning the two words Las Vegas, which he stayed away from all of last year. Uh, but but that's that's part of everything transitioning over. By the way, the building, the headquarters in Henderson is going up fast. I don't know if you guys saw it. No, you you're right by Costco. You said this weekend. Oh, it's right yeah. there. Is it really? <laughs> He's too busy trying to get in there for those free samples. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're trying to get the pierogi <laughs> samples. Uh, but anyway, so so it'll be it'll be interesting. But that thing is going up fast, and um, it's just it's just becoming more of a reality here. And so it's going to be fun. Now, when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about OTAs. We're going to hear from Vontez Perfect. We're going to hear from Paul Gunther, and we're also going to hear from Fred Bolitnikov in Canada. A oh, take off. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> We appreciate it. We're going to talk about that. What do you guys think? 702-889-5978 is the number. You can get on the air in this next uh, segment. At the next break, we will Uh be talking about OTAs. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. The Dodgers take on the Giants today at noon on CBS Sports Radio 1140. This is Silver and Black Today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Heaven. Yes, welcome back, everybody. This is Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio. I am your guide through this world of the silver and black. Scott Branson joined by my co-host Kelly Kreiner and Chaz Osborne. We're here to talk about Raider football. Of course, the Las Vegas Raiders football Soon to be. And uh, guys, let's jump into OTAs and, and talk about what we heard this week. One of the one of the talks of OTAs when you when you look at the coverage and you and you see folks who've been out there observing uh, is the fact that Vontae's perfect. Uh, one of the signings that I think some Raider fans took exception with because of the off the field issues, because of the suspension issues. Uh, so there was – it wasn't as bad as the incognito, which we'll talk about in, the, in another second. But I do think that it was one that people questioned. Now, what we're hearing out of OTAs is that Perfect is acting every bit the veteran leader that you'd want him to be. Yep. He's showing the maturity. He's showing the desire to teach and guide younger players. And, and to me, that is really encouraging. So we're going to listen to some sound here. From Vontae's perfect. The first one, the first cut, number one to our crack engineer, David Stepanian, yep. is uh, Vontae's talking about uh, this team and leadership and, and how good they could be. Here we go. Yeah, uh, like I said, you got to be a leader out there. You got to lead by example. You have to make sure you're doing your job to so they can have confidence in you when the game time comes. Um, and putting guys in the right position. Like if I have to make a line, line stunt for the D lineman, um, putting them in the right position as well because obviously they have their hand in the dirt. So, um, like I said, just being accountable, being on time to everything and making sure you're doing every rep in the weight room. So there he is, Vontae's perfect on leadership, right, guys? So that's what you want to hear right now. I mean, you can hear all you want. Uh, at the end of the day, it comes down to when the rubber meets the road. But very encouraging to hear him talk about that, right? Yep. Well, well, but what do you expect him to say, though? I mean, and I'm not. I mean, I, and I'm not. I'm not dumping on him or anything right now. There's realism again. Well, no, but it's like it's like everybody's the, in the best shape they've ever been. Everybody's playing amazing <laughs> in OTAs. Everybody's being like, you know, him on the field's never really been an issue. You know, but the suspensions and hits and stuff. I mean, he's kind of got that reputation. So anything that's borderline, he's just getting hit with it at this point, whether it should be or not. But I mean, what else do you expect coming from out of OTA? Right. If he comes up and does an interview, like, and is like <laughs> the opposite of that, 
Then we got like, something to talk yeah, about. Yeah, then it's so, that's so, exactly what you're expe- so ex- exactly what from, you're expected him to say. That's what we talked about in the first uh, segment. They just everybody's talking positive and, and yeah, it's, about everybody. But it was nice, you know. He had high praise for you know Cleveland Farrell and some of the young guys. So it's nice for him to to hear him talking, you know, good about the younger guys because usually it's more of like hazing and and uh, yep, can't do that anymore. Right? No, no hazing. Well, they they have the master hazer. Richie Incognito, right? He's. Just, <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. Uh, but but no, I think I, to your point, Kelly. Yes, of course, it's going to be a lot more cheerleading, a lot more rosy uh, picture for everybody because you're you're just out there running around doing off season workouts. Everybody feels good. Everybody's positive. Nothing has given them uh, any issues to where there might be some dissent and things like that. At the same time. Uh, to see him step up like that. Because, guys, yeah, what's he going to say? Yes, he can say it. But what we're hearing away from the press conferences is that that is actually happening and that he's backing it up with his actions. Now, they did ask him also, and I had this reversed, but they also did ask Perfect about this defense particularly. It's a very difficult defense for younger players to learn. Mm -hmm. So that's why they need a veteran like Perfect who played eight years in that system to do that, and here's what he had to say. We can, yeah, we, we, could, we can be great. We just got to put the, you know, the pieces to the puzzle. Um, we're, I feel like this team is very competitive, um, and everybody feeds off each other's energy. When Nick made that breakup, I seen the whole defensive sideline try to run out there and congratulate him. Obviously, they had to get, get ready for the next play, but it's just the energy here is just amazing. Um, and, yeah, I can't wait to start the season off. Well, there you go. Again, you know, well, we can be great. We can be good now. I will say this, and, and we have great chat. Again, we, we simulcast all our shows on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope. Lots of conversation happening. A lot of the conversation around guys, uh, the fact that, that this team, it had a lot of holes. <laughs> you go 4-12, and 12, you clearly have a lot of holes. Yeah. But that you can fill those quickly. Now, I don't, you don't go from 4-12 and 12 to 12-4 and four, very rarely. I mean, it's happened maybe twice. Uh, but you can get better. So I think... Fans have to temper their expectations. We keep saying this: is this team will be better? How much better? We don't know. Yeah, and that's and I, I've said it before. And I mean, it's the way I look at it. This season's not really about the record as much it is as it is. You know, finding out is David Carr our quarterback going forth? Derek, what, no, they say that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it uh, happens, brother. Yeah, especially this early in the morning. But it's like. They can make a they can make a lot of steps forward and it not show up in the win loss category and I think that's the most important thing to people look at. Growth is more important than actual wins this season. Right. And yeah, and and you want to win always, right, Chaz? But at the same time, that growth is exactly what you want to see. You just want to see them progress to the point where they okay. Now you say after this next season they have a lot less holes. They can go out and plug a few people in, and then you're a playoff team. Right. Uh, to hear Whitehead, I think was talking about how it was kind of a revolving door last year. Players coming in and out, and it's hard to get a grasp of the system when you you're not playing along the same guy, and you know you you're not getting that feel when you've got the same guys around you, and the, and you're talking. Whitehead was uh, I don't know if it was uh, Perfect or Whitehead talking about how they they're both taking on the responsibility, and they're that you know he can call out one thing and he can call out another thing, and they you know now they're all on the same page, and so yeah, the growth, and now we're talking about all the you know the players. Um, they could fit in different spots. So I think this is going to be more of a growth year, like you said, just figuring out where people play best, and then, um, you know, moving forward with that. Yeah, absolutely. So here's – I just want to give – the, the three observations that I've had really with OTAs, the, my three big takeaways, is perfect. His leadership role, his mentors, level maturity. Will that carry over on the field? Will he um, let up? I mean, you want him to be mean and nasty, but you don't want him to get suspended. So that's one of the questions. The other thing that I've seen is I think this offense could be very special. There's a caveat to that because my third point backs this one up. But with Antonio Brown, with Terrell Williams, they both seem to be very uh, – they seem to be clicking with, uh, with Derek Carr. Then you have Josh Jacobs, very like the locker room. You have a lot of veterans talking good about him. Again, it's going to be uh, all positive at this point. Derek Carr also. They all seem to be gelling together. Now, the caveat to that is my other big takeaway from OTAs is – Will this offensive line enable that offense to be good and maybe even special? To me, that is the big question. You now have Richie Incognito in there. Uh, you have Trent Brown on the other side. Uh, you have Colton Miller, who has to, has to make a massive step up, guys, if this team's going to be good. 
Yeah, and I think the incognito signing shows that um, – I'm not going to say that they're worried about Miller, but they realize how important it is. So they're getting a veteran who's had a long track record next to him to help him out as much as they can. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, we have our good friend Wally on the line. Wally from Henderson. How you doing, buddy? What's going on today? Wally. Hey, uh, you guys didn't say anything about his best movie. About Tuz's <laughs> best movie? Matuzak. Yeah, One Man Force. Which one? Caveman. Caveman. <laughs> yeah. With Ringo Starr. Remember he was Tonda? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Zug zug landa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, that movie. We're gonna talk about a bunch with Steve Delson after this break, Wally. I mean, it's gonna be a good segment. The twos was just a larger than life guy, and um, exploring him for the rest of this next hour is gonna be fascinating. Uh, what do you remember most about him on the field? Oh, he was just a total badass. <laughs> <laughs> like you said. Like you said, he 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 gets suspended the first quarter of the first game these days. Yeah, no, he would be. And but then, if you, if you want some good stories, uh, there's two books you should read. One's called The Snake, yep. and another one's called Badasses. Yes, I've read. I've, uh, I've read both. They're both excellent books, and they got some great stories of Snabler and him in the hot tub with a bunch of chicks. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and we had Wally. We had the author of Badasses on last summer. And and we'll get him on again because we didn't obviously get to hit all the stories. Uh, so we'll get him on again. But uh, always good. Wally, man, thanks for calling as always. Have a great week, buddy. All right. Later. All right. Well, there you go. So, Wally, I mean, that's the thing. You know, you talk about those old Raiders and it's going to be fun the rest of this hour talking about the life and times of John Matuzak, guys. And and you talk about the movies and you talk about his attitude. And, Kelly, you were talking about him being on David Letterman in 1982 um, I just don't see personalities like that anymore. It, um, it's they kind of try to sanitize the guys a lot because it's they want it to be the family, f- a little more family friendly. They want it, you know. The NFL's got an image issue with a lot of the players and stuff, and they're trying as hard as they can to stamp out stuff like that. So yeah, you won't you won't see stuff like that, with, especially with like social media and everything, oh, yeah. where we find out about everything anybody does. It's, yeah, it, it's a bygone era, man. It is. It is. And we're going to explore that uh, with Steve Delson. Steve is a, just an amazing journalist. Uh, outside the lines, if you've watched that show, he, he won a Peabody, a Peabody Award for uh, a series on the concussion issue in the NFL. So we're going to talk to Steve Delson right after this break coming up about John Matuzak. We're cruising with the twos next here on Silver and Black on CBS Sports Radio. 1140. This is Cliff Branch, former of the Oakland Raiders, three-time Super Bowl champ, four-time Pro Bowl, and you listen to the Silver and Black Show. Indeed you are. Number 21, bringing us back in here on the 9th of June. And in just another week, it will have been 30 years since the passing of of the infamous and great uh, John Matuzak. Of course, the Raiders won two Super Bowls with the Raiders in 77 and 81, and uh, a larger-than-life figure. And we're going to talk about him for the remainder of this hour. Just a fascinating story, and we are joined now uh, by someone who knows him very well because Steve Delson, of course, co-author of more than a half-dozen books, including Jim Brown's biography, Out of Bounds, a book on the Bears, talk, and one that I love because because Steve and I are both originally from Chicago, talking Irish, the oral history of the Notre Dame football. That's a good one for me as well. But Steve is a Peabody Award winner of ESPN for Outside the Lines on the Concussion Crisis. Go watch it. You can find it up online. He's now the president of Delson, uh, Delson Strategies uh, and an Emmy Award nominee for his series on the Penn State football crisis as well. You can check him out at Delson. That's D E L S O H N dot com. But the reason we're talking to him is because he co authored Cruising with the Twos, 1985 John Matuzak's autobiography. And we go now to Los Angeles and welcome Steve in. How are you doing this morning, Steve? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Doing, hey, Steve. doing fantastic. Uh, just a fascinating subject uh, to talk about, of course. Uh, John Matuzak and uh, and and his life and times and and you have a lot of stories which were some in the book some not in the book of course 
Uh, but before we explore that and explore him as a person, as a player, including his childhood and his career, how did you come to be the co-author of his autobiography? Uh, there was a guy named Joe Weeder who had founded a magazine called Muscle and Fitness. Yeah, and it was kind of like it was kind of legendary among people that worked out. Um, he was the person who discovered Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think, mostly. And Joe had a magazine, like I said, Muscle and Fitness. He wanted to, he was starting a new magazine. I helped him start a new magazine. He wanted to kind of uh, combine weightlifting with mainstream sports. Uh, and the magazine was called Sports Fitness back then. It later morphed into Men's Fitness, which is more of a fitnessy magazine. But back then it was pretty hardcore sports slash weightlifting. And we did a cover piece on the Tuesday, and I was the writer. And we got to know each other a little bit, and he mentioned that he was thinking of doing a book. And that led to me becoming his co-author. Oh, nice. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, that, and that's you know, so many things like that, I think. Uh, I mean, obviously, you're a talented journalist and writer, Steve, so it wouldn't be surprising to have uh, someone uh, come to you and help them write a book. Uh, with Matuzak, I, I want to explore, because you spent a lot of time with him, um, you look at his childhood uh, and, and, and how that may have led to the man he became, including the kind of outrageous stuff. But he was a tall beanpole kind of kid, bulked up, played football. Um, his, his upbringing uh, in, in Wisconsin, suburban Milwaukee, of course, um, he lost two brothers uh, to cystic fibrosis at an early age uh, living in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. When you, I, I'm sure you didn't dwell on that a lot with him, but when you talked to him about that, how much did that early life of his contribute to the man he would become and the two's person, persona that we know today? Oh, I think a lot. You know, I think anybody's childhood is formative. And you know, his father was a former Marine, uh, not real talkative with John, you know, kind of a taciturn guy. Um, John felt that the only time he talked to him for the most part was if he had screwed something up. Um, You know, there wasn't a lot of verbal affection. He was close with his mother. She was kind of his best friend, his anchor, I think, growing up. Um, But as you mentioned, he lost two little brothers to cystic fibrosis, which was devastating for the entire family. I think there's, you know, it's hard to figure out the human mind, but for anybody, and Matuzak was a complicated person, but I wouldn't be shocked if he felt some survivor's guilt. You know, I lost my little brothers. Why am I here? Uh, I think he was damaged by that, as was his entire family. Um, You know, I was looking at the book again over the weekend, and I was struck by how tall and skinny he was uh, in high school. And, you know, he hadn't really filled out yet. He looked kind of gangly and awkward. And I think there were kids that made fun of him. Uh, You know, bullying is part of probably most kids' lives, but that doesn't make it any less, you know, painful at the time. Oh, sure. Um, And then, he, you know, he started to fill out. He became a football star in high school. He's also a star in basketball in the shot put. A lot of people don't realize, I think, that he was that good an athlete across the board. Um, but that started to become his identity. Um, you know, he was the star athlete. He was already tall. He started to get muscular. And he was bigger than everybody else. Um, and I think from a fairly... I wouldn't, you know, the, the, the legend of the twos kind of got cemented when he was in the NFL, but I think even from high school, college on, um, he started to become this larger-than-life figure to a lot of people. Yeah. And I think he tried I think he tried to live up to that, you know, t- also, which was part of the problem. Sure. Again, we're talking to Steve Delson, who was the co-author of uh, the book Cruising with the Twos, the autobiography of John Matuzak, who passed away 30 years ago next week. Uh partly due to uh, an overdose of prescription medications. And you talked about his childhood. Uh, just one thing, I mean, to, to show you, because one thing you hear about uh, John Matuzak, before we jump into the football piece, is that, you know, deep down under that exterior, he really 
number one, cared about kids. And, and you can understand that losing two young brothers. But when he was 12 or 13, his two year old, his, his two year old brother dies and he took it upon himself to buy shoes for his baby brother to be buried in because he heard his mother crying that her son's feet had gotten swollen when he died. Uh, and, and those types of things, you know, stick with a, a guy and, and you, you, you try, especially if you look at the seventies and eighties, you know, today men are told to, to share feelings and all that back then that wasn't necessarily the case. So Matuzak coming out of that childhood then goes off to the university of Missouri because he's now a football star in high school. He gets in trouble off the field, Steve. Uh, then he transfers to the university of Tampa, becomes the first pick in the NFL draft, the 73 draft. Uh, but he kind of bounces around. He's, he, he, it's, it's not, I don't think, an exaggeration to say he was a bust considered where he was drafted. So Al Davis signs him in Oakland. Uh, was that just the match made in heaven that allowed him to, to kind of live out that persona and, and to become that larger-than-life figure? Yeah, but let's back up for a second because there's a couple interesting things. You know, he, he went to the Houston Oilers. He was the first pick in the entire draft, as you said. And they were just a train wreck. Uh, they were a horrible team. They had uh, a lot of dissension internally. Uh, Sid Gilman was this old school NFL guy who became the coach after John got there. And he didn't care for Matuzak at all. There was a strike going on. The NFLPA was on strike. And Sports Illustrated at a certain point took a photograph of Matuzak holding up a sign that said something like, I've got the words but it would refer to the strike, and he had like a fist up in the air. And so he was suddenly perceived as kind of this radical guy, which he was radical in certain ways, but he wasn't really radical politically. Right. Um, you, know, you know, again, middle-class kid from Milwaukee, son of a, a Marine. Um, so he jumped from the Houston Oilers to the World Football League, which was this fledgling league. And I think he played like literally seven plays. And then there were a bunch of cops on the sidelines uh, that served him with a subpoena that had been sent there by the Houston Oilers. Um, and then he went over to Kansas City, where he almost died uh, one night of an overdose. Um, he was taking downers and drinking. Uh, Paul Wiggins, the head coach of the Chiefs, rode with him in the ambulance and reportedly was pounding on Matuzak's chest at one point because it looked like Matuzak had stopped breathing. Um, by the time he got to the, and then they trade him to the Redskins, he lasted, I think, a month. Um, by the time he got to the Raiders, he was on his way out of the league. And he wasn't just a boss. He would have gone down in history as probably one of the all-time you know, busts in NFL history. From first-round draft pick three or four years into his career. He's on his way out of the league, probably going to play in the Canadian Football League. And then uh, Al Davis, who owned the Raiders at the time, uh, signed Matuzak after first doing a little bit of due diligence. I think he talked to Ted Hendricks, the legendary linebacker for the Raiders, and asked him about Matuzak. And I think Hendricks looked around you know, at the locker room, which had a lot of characters in it, and said something like, you know, what's one more? <laughs> well, and, and Steve, uh, we're going we're gonna to go to a break here in a few minutes, but you mentioned the story about the Chiefs. That same night, uh, he, his wife tried to run him over with a car, if I recall, uh, and then he, he fled to a cemetery, hid behind a gravestone, and then he made up with his wife or girlfriend or whatever it was at the time, and then he, he got into trouble, and you're, and you're right. Uh, his coach in Kansas City uh, basically got him to the hospital and saved his life. Uh, we're going to pick it up after the break with some more stories. We're talking to Steve Delson, uh, author of Cruising with the Twos, the autobiography of John Matuzak. So don't go anywhere. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. The only way to take Silver and Black today with you is with the Radio.com app. Download it today and search CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas and listen to us anytime, anywhere. Welcome. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today. We're speaking with Steve Delson, who wrote the book Cruising with the Twos, the autobiography of John Matuzak. And we're talking about the fascinating character that was John Matuzak on almost the 30th anniversary of his untimely passing. Now, Steve, when we look at John Matuzak, the football player, of course, he had those great years in Oakland, 77, 81, two Super Bowl rings. um, But he never quite 
could sustain it. Was was that directly due to that off the field trouble, the the abuse of alcohol, of drugs? Um, and did he leave a lot on the table that he that he could have really turned himself into one of the better players of the game? Yeah, I mean, I think there were a lot of things. He had some legitimate, serious injuries, um, which can happen to anyone and did happen to pretty much anyone, you know, played in the NFL. Um, but definitely his behavior off the field, you know, staying up all night, you know, showing up at practice, probably was still alcohol in his blood. That probably happened all the time. Um, there's no way you know, that that couldn't have had an effect on his performance, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, there were a lot of guys on the Raiders, and that doesn't justify John's behavior, but it was absolutely part of the culture on that particular team. Um, you know, at that particular time, you had Kenny Stabler, whose famous line was, you know, used to read the playbook by the light of the jukebox i think <laughs> yep uh, he probably said it more artfully but you know all those guys still villapiano hendrix you know it was a really hard drinking team um and in some ways it was a good place from tuzak um because al davis and john madden allowed the players to be individuals they weren't on the up on having a million rules um but it was also a hard party team and, uh, you know, that probably contributed to Matuzak's drinking. Although I got to say, at that point in his life, um, you know, it probably wouldn't have mattered what team he was on. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, he was, he was a wild guy. He had a self destructive streak, um, clearly. And I think, you know, like I said earlier, as his legend grew, um, you know, he wanted to be the biggest and the baddest. Um, I went out drinking with him one time. I wasn't drinking. I thought we were working, actually. <laughs> we were working uh, but I saw a side of him that kind of shocked me a little bit at the time. Because um, when I was working with him, he seemed like his head was in a good place. And we spent a fair amount of time. You know, you get together a couple times a week, typically, with somebody when you're writing a book and you turn on your tape recorder and do the interviews. And I only saw him party once over that entire period of time. I don't know what he was doing when I wasn't with him, but when I was around him, he seemed like he was healthy, seemed to be in a pretty good place emotionally. Uh, but we went to this legendary bar in Hollywood, uh, Imperial Gardens. They have sushi and sake and I had my tape recorder. I realized a few minutes in, we probably weren't going to get any work done. Um, and he ordered sake. And, you know, most people would order, you know, one drink at a time. Uh, <laughs> and he he ordered 16 little cups of sake. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 16? Now, they were, little, they were little cups, but there were 16 little cups. And I don't think I had any of it. Um, and he drank it all. And I forgot how long it took, but I think it didn't take that long. And suddenly, I, I, you know, I don't remember exactly how this started, but there was a man and his wife were kind of arguing at the bar. And it was not a loud argument, uh, but they were arguing. And Matuzak stood up and started lecturing the guy. Who didn't like it, obviously, but, you know, he was Matuzak. Um, <laughs> and then I don't remember if I went to the bathroom or what happened, but I took my eyes off Matuzak for a minute. And the next thing I knew, he was kind of standing up in the one of the open spaces, like between the bar and where the restaurant tables were. And he was doing karate moves. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, you know, first of all, you realize, when a guy that big is doing karate, like how much ground he covers. Um, and, but it was scary, you know, and he knew, he knew some karate and he was, you know, he was split basically. And what struck me at that moment that night was, if you've ever seen people who just at a certain point when they're drinking, they almost become a 
another person entirely. It's almost like a switch goes yeah. on. Yep. And you just don't recognize that person anymore. That's what happened with Matuzak that night. Um, yeah, and, and that, that seems to be a common theme. Now, we have a, a couple minutes left, Steve, uh, and I know we could probably go on for two hours talking about the time you spent with him because uh, such a colorful guy. But the end of John Matuzak, of course, we all know what happened um, with, with, the, with the, the drug-induced um, uh, heart attack and overdose and all of that. Was there a different – was this going to be the ending? I mean, John tried to stay clean. The longest he could go was 89 days. Was this, was this something that was – going to happen probably no matter what? Um, he, it, it, it's surprising, honestly, that he lived as long as he did uh. because he was so wild. Um, he didn't do well with leaving football, even though he had a good career in Hollywood. That was part of the tragedy of it. He, you know, he did have something going on in his life. Uh, but he just he just struggled so much with self control. Um, I don't know if you know the other thing too is we weren't talking about CTE back in those days, right? Exactly. And I have and I have no clue, you know, the condition of his brain. But he played a lot of football for a lot of years. He probably had some brain damage to some degree. I think every single ex football player does. They may not have CTE, but they probably have some long-term brain damage. Right, and and Steve, um, we're we're coming up on a on a hard out here, but and, and of course, you won your Peabody Award for um, part of a series in, on uh, outside the lines about the concussion crisis, and 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 of course, we won't we'll never know with John Matuzak because he's gone, and this is before players uh, knew what was going on and could donate their brains for study as well. So. Uh, Steve, we appreciate you being on. Make sure you visit Delson, D-E-L-S-O-H-N dot com, where you can hear more about um, what Steve is doing now. It does great work consulting. Steve, thanks for joining us and uh, getting everybody up to speed on what it was like to be around John Matuzak. You're very welcome. I uh, appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, thanks, Steve. Right. Thanks, Steve. Steve Delson, we're going to be step aside when we come back after the top of the hour sports update. We'll talk a little more about John Matuzak and the Raider Mystique and all those bad boys and what happened back in the day. You are listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. You found the most in-depth coverage of The Silver and Black. The nation and the league arrive in Las Vegas in 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's Silver and Black today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back. Happy Sunday, everybody. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, emanating from the future home of your Raiders, Las Vegas, Nevada. Big thanks to Steve Delson, of course, the author who wrote the autobiography, uh, co-wrote the autobiography of John Matuzak with the twos, cruising with the twos to be exact. Uh, fascinating discussion. We, we, of course, couldn't get to all of it with him uh, because there's just so much. I mean, uh, not only was Matuzak a colorful guy, uh, but the stories and, and the legacy, if you will, if you want to call it that, of the player, of the man off the field is, is pretty remarkable. And uh, we want to continue that conversation uh, here with Kelly Kreiner, Chaz Osborne, my co-host and myself a little bit. And guys, you know, Steve talked about the question I asked him about was, was this going to be the ending for John Matuzak no matter what? The, 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 the drugs, the alcohol, the partying uh, combined with the injuries he sustained playing football, especially to his back. Was that going to be his end? Was it always going to be a fast, quick young end. He died at 38 years of age in 1989 in Los Angeles. Um, and that seemed to be, now Steve said that he should have probably died earlier because of right. how, how hard he partied. Um, my question for you guys on this one is, and knowing he talked about Stabler, he talked about Villapiana, who we've had on our show many times, a great guy. Um, the way those guys, as hard as they went, could that? I mean, I don't think you could even do twenty five percent of what they did then off the field, uh, 
now in the NFL, could you? I mean, you couldn't. Oh, no. Yeah, with the way social media and everything is, um, if yeah, it, it, everything would be, it'd be all over the place. The NFL would be on everybody. You know, you'd be headlining Sports Center, <laughs> Fox News all the time. I mean, it, it would be a circus. You know, back in the day, there wasn't as much media going around, and the media would cover for those guys, too. It's like, oh, wow. you, you see all the stuff that he got caught up in, Think of how much stuff never reached anything because it got buried. Yeah, and a lot of there'd be so many more suspensions and those kind of things now with all the new rules. And and you know they, he talked about you know how they played back then. They they actually changed a lot of the rules nowadays because of the way those guys played back in the day. So it's, it is unfortunate his ending. Real um, name. You know his childhood and and uh, younger drug problems and. Unfortunately, that probably was the only way that it was going to end. And, uh, you know, it's, he, was, he was a polarizing figure, and, and that's one, one thing we, we didn't want to see. No, well, and, and again, you know, the, the thing about reading everything I could about uh, John Batuzak in preparation for the show, um, you know, you, you see a guy who, with children, was phenomenal. I mean, he, he would go to children's hospitals, uh, obviously from his own experience in losing losing his um his two brothers and then later his sister to cystic fibrosis here was a man who was very caring and yep. and just people said when he got around kids he was so so um attentive to them and and um just you know a different person and so you, you i think you always have to put into context as much as we hear about the partying and all that stuff you know there's more of a human being than right. just that persona than the actor than the football player and i think it's important that we represent that and that's one of the reasons we want to talk about st- Talk to talk about it with Steve uh, as well, and we have a caller on the line now, Audrey, who wants to talk about John Matuzak. Audrey, welcome to Silver and Black today. Thank you, and thank you for the lovely things you're saying. I, I hope you know the good side of John, like I did. I'm going to cry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. That's okay. My son loved children. He was a good guy. There were two Johns, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, I love my son with all my heart. Well, well, uh, Miss Matuzak, I, I want to thank you for calling in. And I know, I'm sorry, I know those wounds. Uh, being a father uh, of five children myself, um, you know, I know the, and, and my wife lost her sister when she was young. And her parents, you know, when you lose a child, it doesn't matter what age, uh, you, don't, you don't ever, uh, it doesn't go away. It's always with you. And, um, you know, I was I was honored to to learn about your son and to know about the good things that he had done, too, because we do. We hear a lot about, of course, the persona, right, the twos. But, um, you know, the story about about one of your son's passing and, and him buying the shoes and all of that, it shows the heart. It shows. Uh, I've got to tell you another good story. OK, great. He told his sister that had cystic fibrosis that if she, if he made it big in the NFL or any place, he would send her anywhere in the world. And if he didn't, he was going to take her to a little park to play. And when she turned 16, when she turned 16, my other daughter, Karen, was married and lived in Panama. And he sent Dawn because she wanted to go to Panama to see her sister. <laughs> Wow. Well, and yeah. go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, you know, your, your, your son, uh, and again, I, I, in, in reading about him and, and, and the upbringing and what you all went through as a family, um, was, was it hard for him, uh, as he got older was, was the, the, having lost his brothers and then his sister was, was that something that maybe no, his sister died after, John, after he passed. Okay. After. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when 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 his brothers passed at a very both at very early ages, of course. Um, well, you know he he was so disappointed because uh, the first boy Christopher was a twin to my daughter Christine, uh, and he felt chip because he wanted a little brother so bad. Yeah, wow. And is that but is that something that you think uh, was it was it something that the pain from that uh, that I know you and your whole family dealt with was the pain from that something that you feel contributed to him masking it with those things like alcohol and, and whatnot? Most definitely. Um, John would walk into a room, I'm, I swear to you, and it was like he took over the room. He was like a magnet. But <laughs> when he 
was bad. He was really, really bad. And I think it was because he, in his mind, he's always like, why am I still alive? And they're not. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was really bothered him a lot. And I don't know. How close he was to the niece. You know, and even his nieces and nephews, he'd have his niece and his three nephews out and, you know, about buying toys, doing something with them. <clears throat> and somebody say, hey, John, are those your kids? He said, you bet. He never said they were his nephews and niece, <clears throat> and he adored them all. And he 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 just brought them out to California. They did things together. He loved his sisters. You know, it, it, there's so many good parts of him that you you can't explain it because people see this. And he had this facade. He had to be a raider. He had to be tough. He had to, sure. you know, it, it was a part of his. Uh, it was part of his show. Yeah. Well, and, and, and he was. I mean, as a football player, as an actor, of course, an entertainer. And so I understand that. And, and, uh, but, but today, you know, I think that we live in a different time, right, where uh, men's, men's mental health is still an issue. Uh, but to be able to deal with those issues, um, it's, it's unfortunate that, that he wasn't able to. But we, we wanted to make sure that we remembered some of those positive things as well. And we certainly appreciate you calling oh, in and to I share appreciate this. your story. I, I love it. I'm not complaining about any of it. Oh no, it's no. True. Yeah, no, no. And I, I appreciate that, uh, Miss yeah. Matuzak. And and I would love uh, if you could, uh, David, our engineer, uh, will as I as I say goodbye to you. I just want to get your number if that's okay with you because I'd like to call you because um, we we want to do a story for our website too about John and I'd love to talk to you a little bit more in depth on that for that. Um, are you asking my mom for her phone number? This is Karen, her, oh. her daughter. Hi, Karen. Hi. Yeah, we will. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put you on the line with our engineer, and if there's a, just a way to contact her, that would be great. Whatever, whatever you're comfortable with, we appreciate it. Okay, sure, that's fine. Okay, thank you guys for calling in. Please uh, give your mother my best. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, there you have it. Uh, a surprise guest, uh, Audrey Matuzak, John Matuzak's mother. It's powerful stuff. It was, uh, and and she was obviously listening to the show and listening to Steve Delson uh, come on and talk about that. But again, you know, as I was saying, you know, uh, uh, there's more to a man than just uh, the the explosive and the mistakes. We all make mistakes. We all do things. Uh, but there's two sides to every person. Like she said, he, he's trying to live up to that that Raiders mystique himself, and so he only wants to show that tough guy side. Yeah. You know, and, and behind the scenes, you know, he's doing a lot of great things. Kids, like we talked about, you know, and she did talk about, you know, his survivor's guilt, what, what Steve Delshawn was talking about as well. Mm -hmm. and, and Kelly, I mean, you, you, the first time I've ever had somebody's mother call in, but, you know, Audrey Matuzak, a mother who, who lost four children. I was going to say, yeah, it's, it's not just that it was, you know, John, it was all four and it's it's also how, you know, cystic fibrosis is not something. I mean, that's very tough to bring up kids like that. And then to see the one, you know, John was like the one that didn't have the affliction, but he had he had other issues like, you know, the addiction, everything like that. Yep. Take him so young. I mean, it's just yeah. brutal. Well, and that and that's the key. I mean, again, and, and I want to thank Audrey Matuzak for for listening to the show and, and being happy with how we were talking about John because his story is a mixed bag. I mean, there's bad things, and, and she recognized them, uh, and but she wanted to come on the show and, and just talk about the good side of that, and we want to recognize that too as well. And and that goes for all these Raiders. You know, uh, Lyle Alzado, of course, Ken Stabler we know a lot about, and, and, and Phil Villapiano, who we've had come on, who you know, has had a beautiful family, beautiful kids. Um, and so just fascinating to explore that. Um, and uh, this show has turned very interesting, and, and we and, appreciate that. And you said it's a mixed bag, but more often than not, it's the bad stuff that you hear about with guys like this because that's more interesting for people. You know, it's like yeah. they want to hear yeah. about because people love to tear people down and yeah, then right. build, then build them back up. That's the American way. Absolutely. It's like if they we build you up, make you famous or something, we destroy you, and then we can't wait for that comeback. Yep. Yes. Well, I know, I know. And us being on the radio, we get lots of people who – have nice things to say. Unfortunately, about. John didn't uh, get that comeback. We're going to step aside when we come back. We're going to talk Kelly's Corner, Canada. We're li you're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Hoser. You found the most in-depth coverage of the Silver and Black. This is Silver and Black today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Here's your host, Scott Gobranson. 
So one of the things that we at the Raiders take seriously is that the Raiders is a global brand. And for us, we're proud to have a strong international fan presence that we've seen firsthand when we've done these games in places like London and Mexico City and Barcelona years ago. So with this game, um, this year, we'll become the first NFL team to play games in three different countries in one season. The last time I was in Winnipeg, I was catching my breath looking for a oxygen tank on the sideline when I was playing with the Alouettes in 1980. So uh, it's glad to see that there's a new stadium here in town rather than the old place that I played in and coached with the, uh, with the with Stampeders and played with the Alouettes. And it's good to have the Raiders come here because I, I believe, knowing the CFL fans as I do for a number of years I was here, how gracious they are, how sports-minded they are, number one. sport They love their sports. And uh, it's good to be able to see two teams that have a great history throughout their careers as organizations with Green Bay and the Raiders. And knowing that somebody like uh, uh, Mr. Davis from years ago, who is a legendary, as we all know, uh, too bad he couldn't be here because he would love it also. But uh, I just want to say thank you for having the team here. I think the fans are really going to enjoy it. It'll bring the NFL to Canada and especially to Western Canada. So uh, we'll have a great game. And it's good to see everybody, and uh, thank you for being here. All right, the great Fred Bolitnikoff there from Winnipeg, as uh, also Dan Ventrell from the Raiders organization to top it off as that clip brought us back in from the break. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Again, just a thank you to uh, Audrey Matuzak for calling in John's mom who was listening to the interview with Steve Delson. Uh, We appreciate her doing that. Now, the Raiders playing in Canada happens to be the subject of Mr. Kelly Kreiner's uh, weekly segment, which we call Kelly's Corner. And uh, I'm sure he'll have something interesting to say about it. Kelly, Winnipeg, what about the Raiders playing up there? First off, let me say I have nothing against Canada because I can kind of <laughs> see where the Canada. Yeah, I can kind of see where this is going to go already. Um, and I will try to make this the last time I complain about the Raiders' schedule all year. <laughs> How can you but not? you have a team that has such a history in Oakland like you have, and now you're taking yet another football game away from the fans. Right. Now, I get it. It's a preseason game, not the biggest draw. You know, when I when I had my NFL season tickets, I would give those tickets. Actually, I would donate those to charity so I could get the tax write off for the full face value <laughs> of the tickets. <laughs> But it's one less chance these people have to see their football team. You know, preseason games are great for families because you can go on the secondary market, get a lot cheaper tickets because people aren't selling them. It's a chance that some – it's one chance – one less chance that that somebody with a big family or something like that that wouldn't be able to afford to go to a regular game to go to a game, and it's getting snatched away. You lose the London game also, a regular season game. It's like – the last game of the season is not in Oakland. Well, and, and the thing, that, and I don't disagree with you at all. I agree. I think that, number one, the fan so many times gets screwed. Like you know, especially for Oakland fans who the t- the team's leaving after this year, and so those are precious home games. Um, at the same time, this is sort of the Raiders. You, know, you have the Raiders up there with Dan Ventrell and Fred Bolitnikoff putting putting up a good face, right, for this, because we all know that these international games, it, it's sort of like they're taking medicine with some sugar in it, right? Because in order for them to get the approval to move to Las Vegas, guys, they had to agree to these international games and to do more of them than other teams do. So in the long run, fan gets screwed, especially the Oakland fan, let's face it. Yep. Um, and, and, but long term, that was part of the deal. But again, the fan gets screwed, right? There's just no other way about it. Yeah, and you talk about wanting to grow the brand, make it a gro- global brand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here's a good idea. Let's send a preseason game where nobody who anybody cares about is going to be playing football and show mm-hmm. these fans what mediocre crap football looks like <laughs> to really get them interested in football. Right. I, I know I'll, I'll, I'll earn some uh, scorn for this, but uh, they watch Canadian football, so maybe they're used to it. Oh, Hey, man, oh, CFL, longer field, wider field. The Rouge. I, I, I will, the Rouge. I will take Canadian football over preseason NFL That's football. That's true. Well, yeah, if, they're, if, if it's regular season CFL, yeah, because they're playing for something versus. Well, 
And Canada does. I don't think they have a preseason. No, they don't. No, yeah. they're smart, but they don't have the players union we have. So, but why? Why Winnipeg? I don't understand that they're yeah. saying that Winnipeg is west. Yeah. They could have gone Calgary, Vancouver. Is it just because Winnipeg has that new stadium for the Blue Bombers, or what, what was the thinking behind that? I I I think it's because of that, but I I don't know the the entertainment group that planned this event, uh, which has planned other games, including um, games that the Raiders have been involved in in London and so on. That's the venue they chose. Uh, it's a good question. I, I don't <coughs> cash know. grab. <laughs> yeah. Winnipeg paid the most? I, I don't know. Right. Dave, David just said it's 130 U.S. dollars starting out for tickets for that. Wow. That's, for a preseason yeah, game. You, a preseason game in Oakland, you could get seats for 15 bucks. I'm right. sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, that again, though, that but, that's the, w- but will the fans in Canada? It would be interesting to hear from folks if you're from Canada or in Canada and you're listening – and you're a Raider well, fan. And that's the thing. For them, they don't really care that it's a preseason game because it's their one chance to see it. Yeah. So it's like it's like if you go to a play, like if you go to see Hamilton, but you're seeing the understudies, you're still seeing Hamilton. Right. And it's your chance to see it. You know, it's like you're seeing the understudies in a preseason football game, but it's your one chance to see it. So it's like you have no choice. It was pretty amazing last year in London how many fans showed up. And, you know, there were fans of all teams, but I didn't think, you know, just – being over overseas like that, that there would be that many football fans. But it, like you said, it's just an event. It's something for them to go see and do. And yeah, and that's the thing when they're talking about they talk about the crowds that show up to these games in London. It was like, well, yeah, but you only got one to sell. You don't have ten, right? You know, put ten over there, see what happens. Exactly. No, Plus, you have real NFL teams over there. And my whole thing, I say, with, with expansion, if you do a team in London, your team will never be good because the chances of getting free agents, getting college college draft picks to want to play in london is a super uphill battle yeah. no it, it is um but but like you mentioned the hamilton example people pay a lot of money to see a mediocre musical so that made your point right oh there. hamilton was a media hamilton was good it's overrated wow. most overrated musical well, oh, of the last 25 it, years it's wow. not the easy it's not the best mu- i mean it's it does get that it was a very good show oh to each his own each, <laughs> I mean, it's it's no it's no Book of Mormon, which if you haven't seen it, it the Book of Mormon was excellent. Um, I'm trying to think of other stuff. Yeah, that okay. Now we've devolved. Yeah, we've devolved into it. Do we want to talk about musicals? All musicals. S- surprisingly, no. I'm not usually a musical fan. But if both you of were, those, if, like, if you were, if you were to do a Raiders musical, I want to get callers on this seven zero two eight eight nine five nine seven eight. If you were going to do a Raiders musical, like. What kind of music would it be? Would it have to be heavy metal? Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be opera is what you're saying. It would be dark. It would be dark. Well, dark is one thing, but uh, it would be interesting. Uh, a raider, hey, we, we might have just came up with an idea. Well, if they're going to put a wedding chapel. Oh, we, yes. Uh, if that's they're going to have a raiders, raiders wedding chapel. Some, some breaking news this week, as a matter <laughs> of fact. Uh, our good friend Alan Snell over at uh, lvsportsviz.com uh, broke a story that he's been told by sources that the Raiders, um, if they close the deal on the Bally High Golf Course for um, for parking, that they might have a Raiders themed wedding chapel, and there has been an exploration of a Raiders cemetery. What I hey I just bring you the news that Alan Alan's a good journalist. He said that the other news was that that I uh, put out on Twitter is I have. Three good folks who've told me, who have knowledge of the situation, that Levy Restaurants will get the concession contract for the new Las Vegas Stadium. So you heard it here first. Uh, so, so that news is happening. But a Raiders-themed wedding, wedding chapel, chapel Put guys. it up on the poll. Let's see how many people would actually consider. Uh, you because I, you guessing, would be surprised. It would, would be, be a lot. huge – yeah, it yeah. would be a huge thing because especially it's an event-type thing. Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays of game weekend, right. people would fly in for the games, and that's just another thing for right. them to plan their whole thing around. If you're a Raider fan anywhere on the, across the planet, it's like, we can go to Vegas, we can watch a game, we can get married. Yeah. It's just another thing to add to it. And I do have to say that when you mentioned the music and Ice Cube wasn't the first thing that didn't come up. For the, <laughs> I mean, right. no, we, we have folks online who are saying that. Too. Oh, yeah. Well, Ice, it, it's a given. It's like, yeah, Ice Cube's doing Snoop. the. Well, and not only that, but you talk about the wedding chapel. Um, you, you would have to be married by a guy that looks like the logo, right, with the silver helmet and the eye patch. Yep. And uh, there's people with swords, and you walk through the swords. Sure. And uh, uh, as you're walking down the aisle, there's no 
song for the bride. It's Raider, right? Yep. That's that's or the whole thing. Autumn wind. Or just autumn get, wind. Just yeah. get married, nice. baby. Um, just get married, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm thinking we get the old violator to officiate a wedding or violator two. Would I'm be good. sure he'd oh. probably be up for it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure or he would. You could be have too. you could have your choice of the black hole people, like in the themed sure. weddings out here. Darth Raider. You could have Elvis or anything like that. You yep. could have you know. Your, Skulls, Darth oh Vader, now, Violator. Asking our, our viewers and listeners, Wait. would you guys get married? If you're not married or if you're going to renew your vow, I think a vow renewal would be huge. Yeah. Every Raider fan that's already married coming here. Uh, would you get married at a Raiders-themed <laughs> chapel uh, in Las Vegas by the new stadium? Would that be part of your football weekend? I've just got a bad joke in my head, man. It's like if you're a Raider fan, that's the only way you're going to get a ring. Because <laughs> oh, that's oh. like the, there was the, the, Kev, the Kev, I'm a diehard Cubs fan. Everybody knows that. And there was that Kevin Hart ring. It said the best thing about dating a Cubs fan is you know she's not looking for a ring. <laughs> that's just the first thing that popped into my head when yep. you said wedding chapel. Yeah, and and uh, our good friend Ed, our good friend Ed Marshall in Alaska brings up a good point. He says that uh, you don't want to put your anniversary date during football season mm. because then. Well, no, but if you're if somebody's doing this, they're obviously a football fan, too. So it's not like the, if you get the wife to agree to a Raider <laughs> wedding, <laughs> yeah. the last thing you got to worry about is football um, season. She's in. She's you're right. In. All right. Uh, we're up against another break. When we come back, we're going to talk with Jeremy Aguero. From Applied Analysis and the Las Vegas Stadium Authority, he's going to give you the most in-depth update. Don't listen to the non-factual stuff out there. He's going to tell you where the stadium's at financially and otherwise here on Silver and Black Today on CBS Sports Radio 1140. CBS Sports Radio. Hi, this is Steve Wisniewski, and you're listening to the Silver and Black Today. Welcome back to the Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio. And, of course, every week... We like to bring you some update on Las Vegas Stadium and the happenings there for what is a transforming uh, complex here in our city and, of course, for the Raiders. And today we're uh, just excited to be joined by Jeremy Aguero. Of course, he's the principal analyst at Applied Analysis. And if you watch if you watch the stadium uh, meetings and you see who's running them, it's Jeremy. He's the voice. He's the guy who keeps it all on track with all due respect to Chairman Steve Hill. Uh, Jeremy's very good at that, and uh, we appreciate him coming on today with us. So, Jeremy, we just got through a couple weeks ago with the latest uh, stadium advisory board meeting, uh, and the good news is things remain on time, on budget for completion, $805.5 million dollars. Of the $1.8 billion has already been spent, uh, and things look great. Talk about the overall health of where the project's at, especially from a financial standpoint when it comes to the new Las Vegas stadium. Well, look, I mean, I think you summed it up right. On budget, on time. Um, and that's the best report I think we can expect to get. There are certainly some challenges that um, uh, uh, that the stadium uh, has. Uh, that having been said, um, uh, the, the the developer uh, Stadco, who's the company that's developing the Raiders entity that's developing it, as well as their contractors Mortensen, McCar- Mortensen and McCarthy, as well as a number of subcontractors, have just done an absolutely terrific job in facing every challenge that they've had in front of them and finding ways to to make sure that the project stays on track. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy too. I mean, you look at the project funding already at forty four percent with that eight hundred and five and point five million dollars. And one of the numbers that struck out to me, I think, and one of the 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 points that a lot of folks who going back a couple of years were very skeptical about Jeremy was this idea that they'd be able to sell these personal seat licenses. But you look at that revenue already at ninety eight percent of the two hundred and ninety million dollar budget. Has that surprised you how quickly that's gone? Well, look, I think it surprised everybody because, I mean, we established a budget of $290 million, and and clearly they're going to exceed that amount. So like you said, I mean, look, when you're starting a project, there is always some degree of skepticism. And I don't even know if it's skepticism as far as just being conservative. We have ideas, there's expectations, and you hope that you're able to achieve them. When we're able to actually surpass those, and that leads to the ability to actually enhance the stadium that's going to be constructed, I think that's 
not only good for the project, but great for our community. And if we look at, of course, the, the project being funded by the, the hotel tax revenue here in Clark County, uh, and for six straight months, uh, this was above projection. This past March, it went a little bit below, uh, but still overall for the project remains in the positive. When you look at the outlook for tourism and, and for the hotel tax revenue coming in, what do you look at long term? I mean, we go into the summer months, I know sometimes we see a dip there, uh, and then again at the end of the year. What do you guys think about this little dip in April? April, uh, no concerns whatsoever, correct? Yeah, look, I mean, obviously we're keeping a close eye on the room tax. And, and the biggest concern we had, of course, was was the the ramifications of the, the events of 1 October, right, and what that really meant for our visitor volume. And what we've seen is, is once the, those started to dissipate a bit, that we started to see some of that growth. As you mentioned, we had a five of the last six months. We've seen positive growth in room tax. That's terrific uh, for us. And like you said, it was down last month, but the month before, it was up in excess of 12%. So, you know, sometimes you just have things that happened in one month that maybe happened in the prior month, something along those lines. That type of variation is very much expected. In terms of looking at the summer months or looking, as you mentioned, uh, obviously, in December, things tend to slow down uh, from time to time. Uh, or, or every year, I should say, but during those times of the year, it's a little slower than it is in other months. But, of course, we're projecting against the same period of the prior year. And so, um, you you know, hopefully we've adjusted for that. Right now, as you mentioned, the room tax is coming in almost exactly on expectations, uh, you know, two, two and a half years after those projections were, were originally made. And so, you know, we're very pleased with where it is at the moment. In addition to that, there's some important things on the horizon, not only the stadium itself coming online and its potential impacts on visitation, but a lot of convention space is currently in the pipeline, as well as uh, new resorts like uh, resorts for the Resorts World project. And historically, that type of new construction has pushed uh, both visitor volume and uh, room tax numbers up. Absolutely. Again, we're speaking to Jeremy Aguero, a principal analyst with Applied Analysis, about the new Las Vegas stadium. And one of the things, too, that that uh, when SB1 was passed and the, the funding for the stadium was established, uh, this debt uh, waterfall, this debt reserve fund was set up to to protect the public's interest. And again, a number that, that uh, made me feel really good as someone living in Clark County was to look at this debt reserve in your last report of April 2019, already 57% funded at $51.2 million. In year number two, that's at about 13.5% of where it needs to be for this year as far as funding. Talk about that debt reserve and how it works, Jeremy, because I, th- I get a lot of questions from our listeners and, and folks who read on the website uh, about that, not quite understanding what its function is and how it works should it be needed. Yeah, sure. It's a great question. So essentially, the, when the, the uh, bonds are issued for uh, the public's portion of the project, $750 million in total, um, uh, there's a debt associated with that. And that debt has, has to be repaid over the next 30 years. Uh, as part of that, however, um, the way that it's structured is that there is a two-year debt reserve. You said it exactly right. The first Full, the first full year's reserve is funded is was already pre-funded. Um, the second reserve is funded uh, out of uh, revenues as they come in. So revenues in excess of the debt service actually go and are used. The first use of any of those monies after the principal and the interest of the bonds is paid is to fully fund a full two-year debt reserve, which would mean that room tax could essentially come in at zero for two years, and we would have enough money to fully pay the debt uh, at the maximum amount of that debt uh, for two uh, full years. As you said, I mean, I think this should just be one of many reasons uh, that the public has a great deal of confidence in the ability to repay uh, these bonds. Um, Not only are revenues coming in uh, over expectations, not only is there a waterfall, um, but the the conservative nature by which these these bonds are structured um, puts the public in in very good uh, position in terms of ensuring that um, uh, this debt will be 
uh, repaid uh, on time and without uh, any instability in, in the financial situation of the stadium authority or the county that's back in the bond. Yeah, really remarkable. And, and again, a credit to how it was all uh, legislated, of course, up in Carson City uh, as this project started. And Jeremy, you know, I had last week, we, we talked to Jonas Peterson, of course, from the LVGEA, who you're very familiar with. And he talked about not only we were looking ahead maybe and saying, well, geez, if there's a Super Bowl here, it could be a $1 billion economic impact on the area. But we also talked about already what we're seeing from an economic impact with the Raiders impending move and the stadium project and, of course, the Raiders facility in Henderson going up. Uh, you you represent a lot of other folks, too, in the area in your business. Talk about what you're seeing from, from the economic upswing and the excitement building in Las Vegas as the Raiders prepare to move here in the next year. Yeah, look, I mean, that's a big question, right? <laughs> um, you know, when you ask me about the economic impact, you know, the first thing I'm going to say is all those folks that are showing up on that site, uh, the construction workers that are working there, uh, incredible number of men and women, now one and a half million uh, person hours that have worked on the wow. construction of that. And look, I mean, we just think back what our community was going through five years ago. Uh, in terms of how decimated our construction industry is and how important that industry is to our community. You know, it, the first economic impact I'm going to point to uh, is that labor and, and those remarkable men and women because they're just doing a terrific job and it's great to see them back to work. In addition to that, I think the other piece that, that you know, you have to take a look at is, you know, the Raiders are, are coming and that is huge for our community. Um, but it, that's not going to be the only thing that's going on in that stadium. Obviously, UNLV will play its games there, but this week there was also an announcement of bowl games uh, that, yes. that are coming uh, to our community, a bowl game that we didn't have before with the Pac-12 and SEC and Big Ten um, that, that will be there. That wouldn't have been possible but for the construction of this stadium. The, a great um, uh, work accomplishment, if you will, uh, by LVCDA, the stadium folks, and, and many others uh, that have been, uh, participated uh, in that, which I, I think just, again, reflects the expectation and the benefits associated with having the stadium here. I mean, let, well, I think we all know folks from those conferences know how to travel, uh, and <laughs> so that will not only fill the stadium, but fill hotel rooms. Yeah. And, you know, I guess also it's been discussed is uh, Mr. Foley having conversations about an MLS team yes. uh, being in there. Again, more activity that's taking place there. So we haven't even gotten to the point where the stadium is open, and it's all already creating that type of excitement, that type of momentum, and literally millions of work hours of high-paying jobs that are going to those folks. I, you know, look, the long-term investment is what's really important to our community, that investment in terms of filling those hotel rooms, making sure that um, UNLV has a great uh, place to play football, and really providing an amenity that didn't exist before for the 2.3 million people that live here. But thus far, I think it has been... Uh, absolutely a reflection of promises kept by the Raiders. No doubt about it, Jeremy. And I think also you look at all the other projects, you mentioned some of them and the possibilities. You know, I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but you're right about MLS, MLS soccer. You're also hearing national buzz about baseball. That might be a longer-term thing, Major League Baseball. Uh, and, of course, we've seen how the Aviators in their new facility uh, are leading AAA baseball in all of attendance, so people are excited. So you've had this sports renaissance, but then you look at things like the Sphere, right, being built now as well, which is going to be an incredible facility as well. And I really, truly believe that is all because of, of course, the Golden Knights came first, and then the Raiders uh, decided to move here and create this project, which you are so close to. And it's just in a very, very exciting time for everybody here in Southern Nevada. And you are there at the forefront of it doing great work. Jeremy Aguero, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us today. Hey, no problem. Love the show. Thanks so much for having me. There you have it. Up to date on the latest with the Las Vegas Stadium. We're going to step aside and we'll be back here on the Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio 1140. This is Silver and Black Today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas. Thank you again to our sponsors. Number one, the Laborers Local 8872, the men and women building the Las Vegas Stadium. They are a longtime supporter, a big supporter of ours. We appreciate them and everyone inside the Local 872, what they do. Also, 
This show brought to you by Moneyline Sports Bar and Book at Park MGM, home of the NBA Finals and the NHL Stanley Cup Final. Yes, Stanley Cup Final. Come by and enjoy great food and beer specials for each playoff game. Tonight, the Blues will try to close out the Bruins on the ice. And Monday night, the Raptors from Jurassic Park hope to win the first NBA title in franchise history. Come to Moneyline at Park MGM. Eat, drink, and bet. All right. So what a show this has been. It's been crazy with with the Matuzak stuff, Mrs. Matuzak calling in Incredible. Uh, and everything that we have to talk about. Um, but there are some things we want to get back to. Of course, we were talking earlier, guys, about OTAs. Uh, Paul Gunther, we, we heard from Perfect, and, and here I want to play this first clip. Uh, here is uh, Gunther talking about his former Bengal player and now his Raiders uh, player as well. Well, I've spent a lot of time with him, obviously, in Cincinnati as both as a position coach and as a coordinator. And anytime you can add a guy with his talent and knowledge of the system, um, when he became available, it was very attractive to us. So it's uh, uh, he, he's you know he can he knows that the system inside now he can get us in and out of calls. I think some of the, the returning players are seeing the knowledge of the system he has out here on the practice field. So it's good to have him. So guys, I think that's a big deal because because of the complexity of that defense, and we saw last year, right? some issues with the younger players getting confused, getting to learn the system. Having a guy like Burfick back there has got to benefit people, right? Yeah, he talked about, you know, he's he's talking about the fifth level things because Burfick's there instead of just the first level things that he had to kind of start at ground zero with these guys. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, and you've also, like, usually it's like a middle linebacker or somebody that's kind of like that quarterback of the defense or something. That's what they've been lacking. So, I mean, he's definitely going to be that guy out there that's going to be able to kind of, like I said, just getting people in position – at, before the snap of the ball is going to be a lot easier. Now. Yeah. But, but Kelly, besides the fact that that Paul Gunther doesn't like linebackers, I'm just kidding. I'm, it's I'm, it's hearing, I'm hearing that his uh, <laughs> system it's, does it's not. A, it's yeah. a, his system does not value linebackers. Right. Um, but besides that, Kelly, what is the complexity there about why? Why is it hard for people to learn that defense? It's. Uh, I mean, it's just because I mean it is kind of complex because there is a lot of. Uh, kind of like play at the line. It's like you're 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 kind of you're lining up, but you are looking at what the offense is doing a lot more, and you're just a lot more moving parts in there to where he will have he, he doesn't have just like one call when he goes out there. There's going to be kind of multiple calls that you're going to go with, and that's why you kind of need somebody like a perfect who's been out there that's been like, okay, uh, here's preset, here's you know motion or whatever, here's where we're going. Right. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of freelance. I mean, not freelance, but there's a lot of. It's it's, it's almost like getting an audible from a quarterback, yeah. right? But you're on the defensive side of the ball. You're able to switch up the play depending on what you recognize, which is why having Burfick there is such an important addition, in my view. Right. Um, and they also ask though, like, what what is what is Gunther seeing so far from the players that he's gotten this year, and including Burfick, and of course, uh, some of the young players they've added. Jonathan Abram appears. I'm wrong about him. He's been lighting it up. He's in essence, they've already kind of said, yeah, he's going to start there. Um, but here's here's what Gunther had to say about the defense shaping up for this season. It's like getting a quarter. It's like having a quarterback that you've coached in there so you can get in and out of calls at the line of scrimmage. You know, last year, you know, we didn't do that as much. We did it a few times, and I just felt like it was a lot for the guys in the first year of the system to put that added weight on them. I wanted to just kind of go out and play. But now in year two, uh, adding a guy like him and having another year into the system, the guys will pick it up a lot faster. All right, that was yeah. about the complexity. Uh, that was supposed to go before my question for you, but I, I, say, I, I screwed up. Sh- I should probably listen to the sound for the show before because I was like, hey, that, yeah, here's exactly what I just said. <laughs> yeah, that, that was me. That's a great thing about radio is you make your mistakes on the air, uh, which is phenomenal. So, uh, but, but anyway, I think that defense, how good are they going to be? We're not going to know until we get into camp and see them actually line up and get into some preseason games, actually, yeah. mm-hmm. and see. I think they could be – very much improved. They could be marginally improved. Uh, it's going to be a wait and see game, I think, guys. Yeah, and you mentioned Abram as the starter. He was the starter the second they drafted him. <laughs> the kid's a player. I mean, he's a heat seeking missile. He's out there. Like on draft day, when I, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of the pick. It wasn't because of the player. It wasn't because of his play. It was because of the position. Right. Understood. You know? But Gunther, he had really high praise for him. You know, he's saying he doesn't sound like a rookie out there. He sounds like a veteran already. Yeah, I mean, it, it'll be interesting. Um, I do want to talk about, you know, we've had such a, a crazy show here with uh, Steve uh, Delson talking about John Matuzak here close to the 30th anniversary of his passing, and then John's mother calling in. That was unexpected. 
Um, but but certainly we appreciate that. Uh, but I do want to talk about next week's show a little bit, guys. Next week on Father's Day, ironically, very, very with familiar. who we're going to be talking to uh, <laughs> is um, a special guest that we're going to have on, a former Raider, uh, well-known even outside of Raider Nation. But next week, um, Chaz will be on assignment, but yep. Kelly and I uh, are going to be speaking with Todd Marinovich. So Todd Marinovich is going to join us for an extended uh, period of time on the show next week. Uh, if you read the Sports Illustrated article from January of this year, where Todd is, his struggles back and forth with addiction, uh, it particularly is poignant because he's come to grips with uh, his relationship with his father. Uh, and phenomenal. He's, he's now an artist uh, living in San Diego, and uh, his artwork is actually phenomenal. Uh, yeah. Go to marinovichart.com and you can see it. But Todd Marinovich will be with us next week. We appreciate him taking the time on his Sunday to join us next week. Guys, it's going to be a fascinating interview. Uh, I think that uh, Raider Nation is going to want to watch. Yeah, I'm looking to forward to it. It's yeah, he was one of those guys that came in, and we just had, you know, the Raiders had, and the Raider fans had such high expectations. We thought this is going to be the, the kid that takes us to that level and just sustains it for a long period of time. And then what a story, you know, just so many different things happening. And and um, it'll be fun to catch up with him after all these years just to find out exactly, you know, what was going on at that time and what's going on now. Yeah, and he's, he's uh, in talking to him uh, in prep for the show next week, you know, he said, hey, it's an, I'm an open book. Nothing is off the table, so we're going to ask him questions. If you guys have questions, uh, drop us a note uh, uh, on our Facebook page, Twitter, or whatever. If you have a specific question for him, let us know. We, we will ask him. Um, again, he's he's uh, a work in progress, like like us all. But uh, his his trials and tribulations clearly much more in the public eye, right. and the uh, the relationship with his dad and how that all happened, and and now what he's come to grips with. He's actually. For the first time, being honest, you know, really honest with himself about the fact that his dad abused him and and um, physically, mentally, and so on. And so, it's a fascinating discussion. Um, I know some people like to bag, as you said earlier, Kelly, on people who struggled. Uh, I root for people like that. I think to see somebody um, get their life together, forget football, forget what money he had and he doesn't have anymore, or the fact that he doesn't play football or he never panned out as everybody thought he would. You know, you want to see somebody do well. And so catching up with Todd next week is going to be pretty fascinating. Yep. Be good stuff. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up, guys. Wow. We're done. It's crazy. Uh, for, I'd like to, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Kelly Kreiner. Kelly, thanks for being with us again today, of course, as usual, in your duties. Okay. We got, <laughs> we got a nod. Uh, Chaz, thanks, man. Enjoy your assignment next week at the golf tournament. <laughs> right? What? I thought I was, oh, thought yeah, I was going what, to what? mini camp. Uh-huh. All right. And for our engineer, David Stepanian, um, and Kelly Kreiner and Chaz Osborne, I am Scott Branson. Check us out, silverandblacktoday.com. Check out the archive of this show and all the channels you get your audio. Subscribe on YouTube as well. We appreciate you guys being with us. Until next time, may the autumn wind always be at your back. Take care, everybody.